Okay. Um, again, I'm always looking for people to do presentations. Um, I've got a couple of people who've expressed an interest outside the club to do it, but I can't get them to email me back, so uh, it's a hard time of the year. Anyway, uh, last meeting, there was some discussion about other interests in the club, and I found that an awful lot of people who are into ham radio are also into astronomy. Um, and so I thought, well, let's do something completely different. And that is uh, grinding mirrors and lenses for telescopes. I know we're kind of a technically oriented group here, so I thought people might be interested in that. And, you know, this isn't going to be uh, a, a, like a training session. It's just going to be kind of an overview of what it's about, what it takes, you know, what's required, what you end up with kind of deal. So. Okay, background. Um, when I was a kid, there were actually um, uh, quite a few um, what are sometimes called telescope nuts uh, in the area. People who made optics, made telescopes. Uh, there were a lot of places that sold supplies and parts. That's kind of gone the way of chemistry sets and heath kits. There's a couple of places where you can still get mere blanks or order lens material and get the grinding supplies, but uh, it, it's really kind of a dying art. And so it's kind of nice to present this, so you know, if you want to keep it going. Uh, pushing glass, which is kind of what it's called to make these things. A little bit science, a little bit art, and some luck. Mm. And experience is really the key. I think I made my first mirror when I was 13 and it's awful, I mean, it's just terrible. Mm -hmm. But I can crank out a pretty good mirror now. Uh, commercially made optics, like if you pick up a copy of Astronomy or Sky and Telescope, you're gonna see Mead and uh, Celestron and some other makers. Those optics are made almost entirely by machine. There is some human inspection, maybe some human you know, fine work at the end, but um, again, this doing it by hand is kind of becoming lost art. Um, both simple tools and for the test equipment to test your optics. It's amazing how simple this stuff is. Um, and you can make this stuff by hand. Uh, some of the largest and most perfect optical systems date from the late 8th, 19th century, you know, before computers, CNC machines, and this was all basically an art. Well, any telescope has an objective, whether it's a mirror or a lens. And its job is to gather light and form an image which you can look at with an eyepiece, basically a magnifier, or sent to a camera or a spectroscope or something else. And this is one case where size definitely matters. Bigger is better. The bigger the mirror or lens, the more light it's gonna <laughs> gather and the greater the resolution. A lot of first time scope users get caught up in pursuit of magnification. I remember looking at the old Ward's catalog and they had telescopes and you know, 400X, 600X. Oh, yeah. But a good analogy is a lot of astronomical objects are faint. So it's kind of analogous to looking for a needle in a dark basement. Mm -hmm. What you need is a flashlight, not a magnifying glass. And there's a limit uh, on how much power you can apply to a given sized objective due to the nature of light. You get above that, above about 50 to 60 power per inch, and yeah, things get bigger, but it just turns into a blob. Yeah? Is there any difference between, say, just having a strong eyepiece and a barrel of lens? There are some trade-offs. It depends on maybe the application. I think a better combination or a better answer would be to have a Barlow and a medium power lens because now you've got like things you can combine. Uh, but it depends on quality of the eyepiece, quality of the Barlow. But in a lot of ways it's kind of six one and a half dozen of the other. Yeah. Barlow lens is an accessory <coughs> that you place between the objective <coughs> and the eyepiece and it increases the magnification usually by either two times or three times. And if it's designed well, 
But yeah, it works well, and it looks a lot like a higher power eyepiece. Plus, with a lower power eyepiece in a Barlow, you get more eye relief. You can you, you don't have to crowd right down on the eyepiece. So. Okay, let's take a six inch diameter objective. Pretty typical first mirror. Gathers about 460 times as much light as your eye when it's dark adapted and will stand up to around 350 magnification. Bigger is better, but fabricating a large mirror or lens is hard work. If you've got a, say, a 16 inch mirror blank and you're pushing that around on a pitch slap that we'll get to later, you're gonna, you're gonna get worn out. That's a lot of work. And that's where a machine comes in. But if you're gonna do anything with this, you know, hobby, I really advise you don't do anything bigger than a six inch, because if you do, you may bring out that ball peen hammer. <laughs> Plus, getting that optic surface correct goes up, uh, the difficulty goes up exponentially as the diameter goes up. Well, like a lot of other things, there's a rivalry that exists between people who like mirrors, the objective, and people who like lenses. <coughs> Each has its own advantages and shortcomings, but there's some practical considerations for a TM telescope nut. With a mirror, glass is simply a support structure for a reflective coating that we'll talk more about later. The glass involved, and it pretty much is always glass now, way back when they used types of metal, but today it's all glass. Ideally should be a type with a low coefficient of expansion like Pyrex, but it doesn't have to be optically homogeneous. It can have bubbles in it, strains, stresses, it really doesn't matter. Lens, however, since the gathered light is gonna go through the glass rather than just reflect off the surface, the glass has to be of a known and consistent optical characteristic. It's gonna get a lot more expensive. Also, to make a usable refractor, which is a telescope with a, a lens for an objective, at least two lenses of different types of glass have to be used to overcome the uh, inherent uh, distortions that you get with a single lens. That gets even more spending. So is the idea there for some distortion incoming to be uh, somewhat reversed, if you will? Yes. Yep. Okay by the other ones. Yeah. Talk a little more about that a little later. Um, also, you got four surfaces to grind, polish, and what's called figuring, uh, as opposed to one for a mirror. And then the last thing that I found really interesting, I remember the first time I wanted to, to grind some lenses, ordering the glass blanks for lenses, uh, it's, it's really an interesting exercise because if you call up one of these places like Glass Fab and you say, okay, you know, I'm an amateur astronomer, I want to make a lens, I need some glass, click. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to talk to you. On the other hand, if you call them up and you say, I need a, a, a three inch plank, BK7, fine annealed, um, and some other specs, you know, they'll, they'll quote you, but they're of course used to shipping multiple you know, units or very large pieces of glass. So you're gonna pay a premium for this stuff. But you can get it, you just have to kind of play their, their game. And there aren't a lot of places that sell this stuff. So it's not like you can find a friendly one. They're all kind of the same. Famous scopes, 40 inch refractor at the Yerkes Observatory in Williams Bay. The lens, or the, actually the objective, there's two lenses, 40 inches across. And it was made by a company called Alvin Clark and Sons, which was famous in the uh, late 1800s for being the finest optical people in the world. Um, it probably will never be dethroned because in order to make a larger lens than that, they think, I don't know if they're sure, but they think that the sheer weight of the glass will cause it to be deformed. It'll just sag when you mount it in something. Plus, a 40 inch isn't that big by today's standards, so that's probably gonna stay the biggest. I had an opportunity to uh, uh, get a tour, kind of a behind the scenes tour at Yerkes several years ago. Just an amazing place. Uh, 
going out there in the dome, and here's this enormous telescope and grabbing all the cool stuff. <laughs> so there's the objective. There, it's in a cell. Here's the other part of the cell that's going to get mounted up at the end of the tube. Another one, 100 inch reflector, which uses a mirror, Mount Wilson, out in California. Ground and figured by uh, George Ritchie under direction of George Ellery Hale. These are two really interesting guys, and there is a lot written about these guys. Um, Hale was a uh, promoter. Uh, he basically would find wealthy people and then pester them to death until they coughed up the funds to build observatories, like Yerkes, mm -hmm. which is named after this guy in Chicago that made millions uh, with uh, streetcars. A lot of interesting reading. Uh, the 200-inch reflector at Mount Palomar, and then the Hubble. Anybody remember the Hubble debacle? <laughs> the error, yeah, go ahead. Pardon me? Is there a famous bush house that works with the Hubble? Well, he used to, but now he's working on the next one. Oh, yeah. James Webb? Yes, yeah. yeah. Where is he? Oh, uh, Baltimore. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Space Telescope Science Institute. Cool. Yeah. I'd like his job. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it turns out that the air that was ground into this mirror is, is an error that a person who is even just reasonably familiar with some of the tests that we do <laughs> would go, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. It didn't <laughs> look right. But they were so not automated, but they had such a precise uh, procedure in place that the kind of test that I would have done, just because I was curious, was considered too simple. Too, now, we do it this way. We're pros. <laughs> and then I also heard another story, and I doubt this is true, but if you like conspiracy <laughs> theories. When the Hubble scope was being made, it was the era of the Keyhole satellite, which is a spy satellite. And the Hubble is very similar to a Keyhole uh, <laughs> telescope. But the mirror that will be used to look at something essentially of infinity is ground a little bit differently than a mirror that looks at something like two or three hundred miles away, the yeah. Earth. And I've read, again, I doubt it's true, that if you analyze the figure in the defective mirror, it's one that was made to look at the Earth rather than out. And Perkin Elmer, I think, was a company that was making both these mirrors, and they supposedly got mixed up. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like I remember reading in an article <coughs> about the the, the mix-up for the Hubble. Oh, you know, this is years ago. Yeah. Um, something about you know how if you have a <coughs> equation that describes the curvature x squared minus two x plus four or something sure. like that, yeah. that somewhere in there, I mean that was what was controlling the grinding. Yeah. They had a plus or a minus sign changed or could be backwards or something. Yeah. Something <clears throat> yeah. like that. Yeah, could be. We were talking about the inches of the telescope strike. Do you think that's Mount Palmer you're talking about? Yeah. Right. Is it there? Right there, yes. Yeah, but isn't it true like, you know, just because we have a minimum noise floor and ham radio, it's sort of kind of like a because the atmosphere have the same sort of, you know, beyond a certain point, you really can't get more light in or something? Not really. Um, <laughs> the biggest problem with large optics <coughs> is supporting them, and, you know, in a scope that's going to be positioned in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so the technique today is to use multiple mirrors <coughs> and then have active uh, machinery that deforms each mirror a little bit to compensate for effects of the atmosphere and sagging of the mirrors. But I don't think there's really a limit on a diameter that won't <laughs> gather more light. I think it's, I don't know that there is a limit. There might be, but I don't know about This is, um, I think this is John Anderson, the chief optician when they were grinding the 200 inch. Okay, so what is this all about? Well, if you take two pieces of glass, 
and you grind them together with an abrasive and you have an overhanging stroke, you take the top one and take it you know, off center. If you have good contact and you rotate things to distribute wear, the top piece of glass ends up with a concave curve and the bottom piece ends up with a convex curve. And that's because like at this point, if you're putting pressure on here, you're getting maximum wear right in here, which is the center, the top one, and the edge at the bottom one. And that'll typically give you a spherical curve. Hmm. Kind of what it looks like. That's how I made my first one on a barrel, because you can walk around it, rotate things easily. <laughs> Rough grinding is typically done with 80 grit silicon carbide. That means you can line up 80 bits next to each other and they're made up an inch. And you do that until you get to the desired depth. <laughs> That depends on the focal length. What do you want this thing to focus at? Mm -hmm. Typically, first timer, a lot of times 48 inches. Depth of that curve, called the sagitta, mm -hmm. for this focal length can be calculated. There's a formula. And for that, six inch diameter, 48 inch focal length comes out to a 0 0.0468 inches, which is very close to the size of a 364 inch drill bit. And that's handy because you can measure it pretty simply. Just take a straight edge, lay it across the mirror, see if the bit will fit under. If it won't, it's not deep enough. If it's loose, it's too deep. Well, if you go over and it's too deep, Oops. all you have to do is put the thing on the bottom, which we call the tool, on top, and do a little grinding. That tends to flatten the curve. And you don't have to get it exactly right. You're going to do a lot more grinding, and there, you can change that depth a fair amount. Really what you want to get here is just the main part of the glass hogged away. Uh, I think I skipped one. No, I didn't. The F value, uh, it's simply the ratio of the focal length to the diameter. Uh, in this case, we got a 6 inch diameter, 48 inch focal length. 48 is uh, eight times bigger than six, so it's an F8. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is because F values are important depending on what you want the scope to do. Uh, F8's a good standard, if you will. Uh, lower F values are called faster because they provide a brighter image and you can expose film or some detector in less time. On the other hand, as the F value gets lower, the getting that curve right, again, goes up exponentially. An F4 six inch is a challenge. Uh, say a 16 inch F4, really challenging. Well, fine grinding, same thing. All you're doing is using smaller grits to get the pits and scratches smoothed out, if you will. And typically, they start with 120 grit and go through maybe eight or nine um, gradations down to something about five microns, which looks like talcum powder. Very fine. And maybe you'll do an hour's worth of grinding with each one. The real key here is you've got to clean up after you change grits. Because if you're at, oh, I don't know, 800 grit and a... Uh, 220 grit particle gets in there, you're going to get a big scratch across <laughs> and you're going to have to go back and work that out. Well, what you end up with is a mechanically smooth spherical surface, like you could take a globe, lay it in there and it would match that curve, uh, with the appearance of ground glass. Well, now we've got to move on to a different technique called polishing. We're going to take the surface from one with pits and scratches, maybe a couple microns deep, to an optically smooth surface, peaks and valleys on the order of 0.05 microns. And it's accomplished by coating the tool, that piece of glass on the bottom, with a layer of melted pitch using a polishing medium like Jeweler's Rouge or cerium oxide. Jeweler's Rouge is probably a better polishing material, but man, you just think about getting it anywhere and it, it stains. 
I've got stuff that's 40 years old that I've touched with uh, rouge and it's still red. Can't get it out. <laughs> and this can take anywhere from 4 to 12 hours. Polish it. <laughs> Later, a pitch is called a lap. And for a 6 inch or larger mirror, it should be channeled. Got a grooves cut in it. And here's another key point. You've got to have really good contact between the mirror surface and the pitch. If you don't, you're going to have a devil of a time getting that shape right. And experience is really useful here. Um, heating the two things and pressing them together can help establish good contact. There's other techniques as well. And when you're moving this glass over this pitch lap, it, it should have a definite drag or resistance. I don't know, everybody know what pitch is? It's almost like tar, like asphalt almost. You think there's any liquid on that? Oh yes, yeah. You mix the rouge or the cerium oxide with water. Did you say that Yeah, I may have forgotten. No, it's okay. Yeah, like a, like a slurry. Yeah. You also mix the grit with water too, but that's more to help it just move around. Here's what a pitch slap looks like. It doesn't look pretty. It doesn't have to look pretty. It's just channel. Uh, it's probably maybe an eighth of an inch deep, maybe a little less. What's the reason for the grooves in there, the channels? Good question. One of the dangers in polishing <laughs> is you end up with a mirror that's maybe highly polished in the center and not very much on the outside or vice versa or something. The channels help move the water and the rouge around, mm -hmm. distribute it more equally. It also is important because as you're polishing, that pitch is going to yield, it's going gonna, it's gonna to move. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have channels, it really doesn't have anywhere to go. And that will end up pr or producing lumps or, or mm -hmm. little ridges. So this gives it a little room to expand and contract. And that's another good indication of contact, is if the, all these channels start closing up as you're working, it's an indication you've got good contact all over the lab. What goes on? Well, I don't know. I don't know what anybody really knows. I've read an awful lot about this, and some people say it's just grinding, except with a very small particle. <laughs> And it, it's a particle that's stuck in a yielding medium, the pitch. Other evidence points to you're actually melting uh, just a, a, maybe a few molecules deep of the glass surface, which then flows. Uh, glass is considered a high viscosity liquid, so <laughs> I don't know. But I tell you, you got a big mirror and a good contact, and you're pushing this glass around. It gets hot. You pull that disc off, and it's hot, and so is the pitch. Uh, does, the, does, the app, does the weather outside that affect your mirror and stuff a lot? You want the room you're doing this in to be a relatively constant temperature, yeah. So how about like, when we were kids with a telescope, we took it outside, you know, especially during the summer. Does the temperature outside have a significant impact on the mirror and the lens? It can. But if you give it time, it should equalize. But if you take it from a very cold environment to a very hot environment, and you're looking at like a star, you will see optical effects as it equalizes to the temperature. So yeah, it does affect it. Um, OK. This is where things get interesting. Question. Yeah. How do you get the pitch to be a constant thickness across the surface? Well, when you melt the pitch, you take the tool, and typically you'll put a, a ring of like masking tape around the edge that extends I don't know, a quarter of an inch. You pour the pitch onto the tool, and to a depth of maybe an eighth, and you just let it cool. Now it may be a little thicker in the middle or on the edge, I don't know, but it really doesn't matter as long as you don't expose the glass underneath, and as long as you have good contact between the glass that's the mirror and the surface of the pitch, the depth of the pitch 
isn't all that important. I'm still not following that. The, the pitch is on a convex surface. Yes. And you're you're then going to be polishing or, or working <coughs> on a concave surface. Yes. But if you pour milk and pitch in there, it's going to level, isn't it? Well, it will level, but then what you have to do after you cut the channels is you have to take steps to press the mirror down onto the so pitch. So you reform it with yes. the... Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. So it's going to take the form of the mirror. You better have that right. Or you better. Be, yeah. yeah. All right. And, I mean, some people, especially beginners, will just start polishing, and eventually the pitch will take on the form. But that's probably not the most <laughs> efficient way to do it. Yeah, and you may have to heat that lap up, get it softer, and press the mirror again. Or you can do cold pressing, where you put the mirror on top and you put a bunch of books on the mirror and leave it overnight. Uh, because pitch will flow, given a place to go. <laughs> lap is the key. A lot of different kinds of pitch. Some are pretty soft, <laughs> others are really hard. And every glass pusher seems to know the best consistency. I tend to like a softer lap. I think it produces less scratches or less opportunities for scratches. I find it easier to understand what's going on. Uh, How many mirrors have you ground? 40. 40? Yeah, I suppose. Oh. Yeah. But I've been doing this since I was like 13. Wow. So. But kind of like uh, building <laughs> Yeah, yeah. How many radios have you built? You know, <laughs> most people would go. <laughs> here's a here's a good test for. Um, did I skip a slide here? Let me see. I guess not. Okay. Well, when is polishing done? I mean, how how do you know? Well, you know because the surface <laughs> will go from looking like brown glass to clear, but. How clear is clear? Well, a couple of ways you can do it is with a red laser, kind of at a, a very sharp angle, shine that in there, and you'll see the reflection from the back of this glass blank. But hopefully you won't see much of anything from the front because it's so smooth. Um, this is just a, another image using a green laser. Um, I think it's a more powerful little pointer, and you can see the light, it's just too much. So you got to get the right laser for this. Um, another good way to test this is you, you take your mirror and you put it up to your eye and at a very grazing angle, look at a bright light source, and that will tend to show up pits and scratches to look like frost or haze. It's probably the biggest mistake beginners make is they don't polish long enough. Well, we've polished it, we're done. No, not, not yet. What we probably have at this point is a reasonably good, smooth, spherical surface. Except when something's gone wrong and we don't. Maybe you didn't have good contact between the mirror and the lap. Maybe you didn't rotate things enough when you were grinding and you've got something goofy. Well, we'll get to that. Then at this point, we move on to what is known as figuring. We want to change our stroke so we go from a sphere to a parabolic curve, which is typically what's used in a reflector. Parabolic curves, conic section that will focus all incoming axial, direct on rays, and rays reasonably off axis, coming in at a bit of an angle from an infinitely distant point source to a point. Um, the reason you can't or don't want to use a spherical mirror is because rays falling near the center of the objective come to a focus farther from the surface than rays falling near the edge. It's called spherical aberration. And if your F value is high enough, like an F10, probably doesn't matter. You can use either. <coughs> The difference is so slight it doesn't matter. But if you're doing like an F4, oh man, a spherical F4 mirror will produce terrible images. So. Luckily, if you get everything right, doing this polishing 
will by nature tend to produce a spherical surface. Okay, challenging part now. Mechanical measurements aren't going to do us any good here. We're talking about errors in the surface, perhaps a quarter to a tenth the wavelength of green light, which is about, I think, 530 nanometers. Very small uh, uh, distances here. We've got to have some kind of an optical test that calls upon the interference of light waves to do our testing. Amazing how simple some of them are. Amazing how hard it is interpreting what you see. Basic idea, set up your mirror on edge and out here in front of it at two times the focal length called the center of curvature. And viewing this uh, image that your, your tester is going to produce, you have to look at what you see and interpret that as to what kind of a surface you've got. A lot of different tests. Foucault, Caustic, Hartman, Ronke, there's lots of others. I like the Ronke test. It maybe doesn't give you hard numbers as easily as some of the others, but it's very intuitive, and you really can get good, good results once you kind of have practiced a bit. Part of the test setup is a thing called the Ronke grading, and it's simply a clear medium like glass. It can even be like a, uh, a film, like an overhead transparency, on which has been deposited in a series of opaque parallel lines. Greater number of lines per inch, more sensitive. I typically use a gradient with about 125 lines per inch. That's kind of what it looks like. You know, the white part would be glass, and then the black would be the opaque areas. The, the straighter and more defined the lines are, the better. Well, here's how you do it. Here's your mirror. Center of curvature is right here. Typically, that tester is a box with a light in it, just a, a bright light source. And frequently, this is a pinhole or maybe a slit, two razor blades, very near touching. The light leaves here, reflects off the mirror, and focuses right there, and you just look <coughs> through the grating. And here's what you'll see. But how far away is that from from your lens? It's got to be much further, doesn't it? If the lens, if the mirror has a focal length of 48 inches, for instance, yeah. the tester will be two times that away. So that's all. That's all. Yeah. Don't you have a parallax problem then? No. As long as things are reasonably lined up, you don't. And. If you do have a serious problem with that, you're going to see an effect here that's pretty oh. easy to recognize. But look how straight those lines are and how they're all the same width <coughs> and the distance between them are all the same. Mm -hmm. And there's no funky bends or twists. Is that one you built? No. Oh. No. This is a, an image I probably am violating copyright from somewhere. <laughs> but that's what it looks like. And that, that's indicative of a good sphere. That's what you want to see when you're done polishing. Well, here's what happens as you move that tester somewhat, maybe a few inches back and forth. Here you're further away from that center of curvature. Here you're closer, closer still. You can see the lines are getting fatter and, and spread out more. And if you can get that tester so that there's just one bar that fills the entire mirror, you're now doing something much more like what's called a Foucault test. And you can see, I don't even know how to describe it, you can see uh, deficiencies in the surface that are probably maybe even a little less than a tenth of a wavelength of light. It's almost like you have a glass surface that you're illuminating from the edge with like a flashlight and it amplifies the irregularities. And it's really interesting to look at that because that can confirm whether or not you've got good contact with your lab. There's a dreaded condition called dog biscuit where the surface <laughs> looks like a bowl of oatmeal or a dog biscuit, just lumpy, bumpy. The whole baby. 
you don't want this. The, these are actually two bands, like we saw before, but they're twisted, distorted. This is an astigmatic surface. This is a surface where if you think about the mirror being like a bowl, the curvature along here is not the same as here, or maybe here, or here. It's got to be a figure of revolution. It's got to be the same curvature no matter where you're looking at it. And this is difficult to fix. You might have to go back to fine grinding. Uh, and will produce just abominable images. So it's like having an astigmatism yeah. in your eyelids. Yeah. yeah. And a real, real definitive, something that just screams out when you're doing this Ronke test. As you move that tester around, those bars get different width and so forth, but they shouldn't rotate. If they start to rotate, you've got some astigmatism. So when you see a pattern like that, do you do a test before you have it silverized? Or oh, yes. Done? Yeah. Okay, so you see it coming and you know what you have to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, when I change that surface from a sphere to a parabola, typically what that means is your polishing stroke, you lengthen it, which tends to polish more glass out of the center area here and this is something where experience is probably the only way you're going to really achieve this. It's important to let that blank come back to room temperature before you test some more. And here's what a rocky pattern would look like for a fully corrected six inch F8. Do you see the difference? Lines are kind of bold a little bit, fatter in the middle. They're not straight. And again, this is qualitative more than quantitative, but there are programs, free ones on the web, where you can punch in your diameter, your focal length, and it will produce an image that you can print out of what these should look like. And you can take that, look at it, look through your grading, get the same number of bands across, and when they look really close. But that's yeah. the effect you see with a wide-angle lens on a you know, film camera or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same kind of thing, because six inches would be a real short focal length, wouldn't it? I mean, for this kind of thing? Six inches of focal length? Is that what you... Now, six inches at F8? F8, so it's a 48 inch focal length. Oh, six, six times eight. eight. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. Did I answer your question? I'm not really sure what your question was. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if the question was valid. Okay. <laughs> well, I didn't realize what six inches was all about. Diameter. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, and I was thinking. No, 48 inch focal length. Okay. And is this pattern that you see here is, is giving you information both for the X and Y axis? Yes. So yep. it's a complete yep. answer yep. to what you've got. Yep. So if you if you took your lens and rotated it at 90 degrees, you'd get the same. You better. Look the same. Yeah. Well, with this, <laughs> if you get this yep. pattern, you're not going to, you're not, there's, no way you can get a different pattern right. from the lens. It, unless there's something wrong with the surface. But wouldn't it show up in this view? Probably, if you knew what to look for. Yes, okay. yes. I think he's would. on the point that the defect will move as you rotate. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now you got to get the thing coated because bare glass does not reflect very much light. Um, Early days, done at room temperature, pressure by depositing a layer of silver on the surface. And some of these recipes called for chemicals that if you let them dry out, would form mercury fulminate, which is explosive, very explosive. In any event, mercury or uh, silver has a lot of disadvantages. It tarnishes soft. <coughs> so today, the most common coating is aluminum. You've got to clean it real well, put it in an airtight vessel, 
You have small coils of aluminum placed on heating elements near the surface of the mirror. Suck all the air out, and then current is passed through the heaters, vaporizing the aluminum, which then precipitates out and coats the surface, uh, very just intimately coating that. Just like when you make chips. Make chips, yeah, yeah. Vapor deposition. Yeah. And it's just a few molecules thick. Here's a, an aluminizing chamber. The mirror would go down in here, they'd lower this down. And one of our members, um, Robert Shaw, Bob Shaw, works for the Eisenhower Observatory, which I think is part of the Edina school system. They have a chamber. And he was, he was going to be here and do a little side bit on aluminizing, but I guess they've all been sick, so they're having their Christmas this weekend. <laughs> Of course, you gotta have a lot more to have a telescope. You have a tube, mount the thing in. A little flat diagonal mirror to intercept that converging cone of rays and direct it out the side of the tube where you can mount an eyepiece or a camera. And the mount, the thing it sits on that allows you to aim it. And that's often the part that receives the least attention, but it's really only second in importance to the optical quality. There's nothing worse than a bad mount. You're looking in there, and that image is just, at every breath of wind, just bouncing around. Okay, building all of that, I'm not going to go there today. What about lenses? Well, a lot of what we've talked about is the same for lenses. Pitch laps, grinding, all that stuff. However, a lens has a curved ground in the front of it, as well as the back. And those two curves have to be coaxial. In other words, they have to be centered on each other. They can't be offset. In practice, that's usually checked by measuring the edge thickness all around the lens, which should be the same. Center thickness is important, too. So you've got to pay attention to all of those mechanical details. Uh, all this adds several more constraints. However, most optical recipes for a telescope objective call for nothing but spherical surfaces with one caveat. So if you've got good contact in your polishing, you're going to get the, the right surface. And they're a lot more forgiving than mirrors, about four times less in terms of the curve uh, accuracy and surface smoothness. Testing, though, it's interesting because a convex surface doesn't by itself form an image. So you can't take a convex lens, set it up with a Ronke screen, and test it. You have to go to some more difficult links. Um, a lot of these re recipes, in other words, the curves and the lens thicknesses, call for one of the surfaces, typically the last one, to be optically flat or as the big wigs like to call it, a sphere of infinite focal length. <laughs> not convex, not concave, but flat. Mm -hmm. And one of the, I don't know, status things in telescope making is that when you can make an optical flat, especially a, a large one, maybe a 10 inch, that's accurate to a quarter wavelength of green light, you have arrived. <laughs> you get the secret handshake. <laughs> and, Got to have two lenses, at least. Some scopes are made with three. Got to have two lenses just because glass refracts light or bends it of different colors by different amounts, where a mirror reflects all colors at the same angle. For example, a single lens will focus blue light to a point closer to the lens than red. It's called longitudinal chromatic aberration. This can be greatly mitigated by making one lens of a low refractive index glass, like BK7, and another of a higher refractive index, like F2. F2 glass is a lot like what they make fine crystal out of. And the idea is you're going to grind that BK7 lens to converge light, while the F2 lens will be ground to diverge it. So it's going to have a concave surface, maybe a flat, whereas the one in front will be convex on both. 
but the f2 lens won't cancel the refraction that the BK7 lens does, it just extends it. And by mixing all this together, you get a combination where you notch out or cancel that chromatic aberration. And I mentioned before that if you use a spherical surface for a mirror, plus it's a very long focal length, it's not going to look good. Well, again, with these two different types of glass, you cancel out that spherical aberration as well. Clever. Okay, some odds and ends. Sorry, scratches the surface. <laughs> Lots of other kinds of optics, corrector plates, goofy, strange surfaces that you have to grind, prisms. Some of them are really tough to make. A lot of information is uh, published on the history of optical fabrication. Uh, those two guys, Ricky, Richie and G.E. Hale, and there's some, and they, they can make a soap opera out of those guys' lives, a reality show. And then there's this guy that I really find interesting. I've read quite a bit about him, Bernhard Schmidt, who developed a very complex type of optic, literally single-handedly, and I, I don't even know if that's spelled right. My spell checker just wouldn't buy that, but whatever. But literally, because as a kid, he was very inquisitive and precocious, and one day he got interested in an explosives, and he blew part of his right hand off, and then they had to amputate it below the, the uh, elbow. So he developed a thing called a Schmidt corrector plate, literally one-handed. And it, it's really a neat deal. You take a, a pan, you put your flat glass plate on the pan and seal the edge, suck a certain amount of air out, which deforms the glass slightly, and then you grind and polish a sphere into that glass. And when you let the air back in, the glass goes back to its natural condition, and you get a plate that has a very strange curvature to it. And it's very useful to make very fast, very large diameter cameras. It's called a, a Schmidt telescope. OK, some resources. And this could be much longer, but I'm yammering long enough. The Bible. Amateur Telescope Making, three volumes edited by Albert Ingalls. It's from the 20s and 30s, maybe 40s. And some of the writing is a little, you know, where are you from? It's a little odd. But oh man, there's stuff in there. It'll keep you busy for a lifetime. This is my favorite. All About Telescopes by Sam Brown. And this book has chapters on optics, on telescopes, on astronomy, on observing, on film, which a lot of that is really outdated. But making mounts, the drawings are like, oh, just beautiful works of art. If you can find that and you're interested in this topic, get it. Uh, it's, it's funny, it's been reprinted a couple of times since it was first published in the original one, which I think I have. You know, he's got a lot of drawings of people, you know, with telescopes in their hands and looking and observing. He's a real artist. And then later printings, I think they're probably done in the 70s. By that time, I think Brown might have actually been dead. They had someone come in and redraw the faces and put beards on people and long hair. And it's like, whoever did it wasn't very good. And it's just a riot looking at some of this stuff. Uh, Wilman Bell, they're on the web. You can get mirror blanks. You can get uh, braces, rocky screens, books. Very good place. I've dealt with them many, many times over the years. They're very good. Um, Newport Optics is another place where you can get lenses, lens blanks. Um, so you don't have to deal with like the manufacturer like Glass Fab and get hung up on. I think that's it. <clears throat> Did all of your 40-some mirrors become telescopes? No. No. In fact, I think of late, for the past few years, I've been more interested in building or grinding mirrors and lenses that are used in test equipment. Like a flat, uh, an optical flat is a very useful piece of equipment. 
you can use it to test lenses in interesting ways. So, and besides the fact, I mean, when I was younger, I would go out uh, every Friday and Saturday night when it was clear, uh, maybe not this time of year, and I'd be out there all night, literally. I'm just not that young anymore. I don't want to fight the bugs. And, you know. How many telescopes do you have? Probably six or seven. Oh, oh you thin them out. I've thinned them out. Uh, not directly related, but since we were talking about telescopes and this is a hand radio stuff, do you have radio astronomy as a hobby? And you know, at one time I got about halfway <laughs> into building a receiver. And I was going to mount, I think it was at like 460 megahertz, two, what were they? I think they were basically two Yaggies at an observing site that the club I'm a member of has out in Afton. It's a really nice site. And, but it never got off the ground. It just then went on to other things. But I've thought about it. Yeah. What's the biggest telescope you have? The <coughs> largest diameter one I have is an 8 inch. Eight inch? Okay. And it's called a Schmidt Cassegrain. And it uses a, a Schmidt corrector plate. You know, It's a commercially made instrument. And when I got it, that was a big amateur telescope. You didn't make this one? No. Okay. Today, there are people here in the Twin Cities that have 30 inch diameter mirrors. Whoa. These things are enormous. Um, and they're taking pictures with CCD cameras <laughs> that you would only see from professional observatories, say, 25 years ago. The hobby's changed a lot. But what is, what I, is a 30 inch telescope weigh? A lot. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't know. The tubes are usually like just truss designs to keep the weight down. But the main mirror, if there's kind of an unwritten rule that says the main mirror, the thickness yeah. needs to be about one sixth of the diameter so it doesn't sag. Okay. So picture a thirty inch diameter, what, five inch thick yeah. chunk of pyrex. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And do they grind them themselves, or someone else do that? Um, I think I know of one guy that's maybe made something that big himself. Okay. But almost all of these that I know about in the area are commercially made. Okay. Yeah. And they're not cheap, but they're cheaper now than they would have been 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do amateurs use the honeycomb structure to replace the solid glass plate? I recall seeing a tour of a, a yeah. Corning Glassworks that yeah. had a giant uh, glass something or yeah. that had to look like a honeycomb in yeah. it. The, the, the 200 in. inch uh, has that <coughs> style, and the 100 inch has something similar to it. Most amateurs, I don't think, will typically be using that kind of a mirror because it's more expensive. So it's not. It's not has that, that idea hasn't been accepted into the amateur well, astronomy. I, I don't for smaller telescopes. But not for smaller ones, because with smaller ones you don't need the advantage that the honeycomb gives you in terms of weight. Okay. Um, but there's no reason you couldn't. Okay. And there may be people who are. Yeah, I would think it would be if you could get the blank with yeah. the honeycomb back on that because it yeah. would make much yeah. difference. Yeah. Um, you had pictures in there of somebody, you know, actually grinding their own, what, approximately six inch? It looked like a six inch. Okay. So suppose today you wanted to do that, start out from scratch. What would just those two pieces of glass blank cost you? I, it's been a while since I've had to buy any glass, but if you go to Wilman Bell, you can find some, and I well, think just ballpark. Yeah, I think for a six-inch mirror and blank, I want to say forty bucks. Okay. The abrasives, another thirty. Pinch, fifteen. And the barrel idea is a good idea, but what I do now is I just have a, a like a three-quarter inch thick plywood board mm -hmm. that I put on a countertop, and then I just rotate things there. I don't have to walk around. <laughs> Yeah. Now you know. Thank you.
Thank you very much, yeah. Bob.